John Latham. He lived here from 1983 to 2006. And John Latham and William Blake have certain affinities. They both were sort of positioned outside of the mainstream in their respective centuries in their artistic practice. They both built up cosmologies and ways of understanding the world that were quite different from the, main, the, 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 the ways that were going on around them. And, and we both were regarded as these eccentric, unusual figures producing artwork that didn't quite fit into their time. And so there's this nice, this really appropriate, wonderful relationship with these two figures from different centuries that we're so grateful to be able to bring together in this space. Um, I have to say how grateful we are to the Sir Dennis Mahon Foundation for being able to make this <coughs> exhibition take place, for supporting the show but also how grateful we are to the partners that we've worked with to curate the show, which are Magnus Reno of the Sir Dennis Mahon Foundation and also Chris McCabe. So Chris, who has been an absolute pleasure to work with this whole time and whose energy has really allowed all of this to take place. Um, together, Chris, Chris suggested um, a, 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 a selection of poets that would respond to this exhibition, some of whom are here today, and one of whom is Niall McDevitt, who's going to be leading the talk as well. And, and so I, I just feel so grateful that by bringing Blake to Peckham, we're able to actually go out and explore some of these places of importance to William Blake. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm really grateful you could all make it today. Thank you. I'm going to hand over now to Chris McKay. Thank you, Gareth. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we are going to go out. It's raining. Um, we just did an inspection uh, in the backyard <laughs> at cricket umpires and uh, decided it's probably OK. And the BBC says it's all going to clear by one o'clock. So <laughs> but don't trust the BBC. That's a quote from William Blake. Um, so I mean, I was going to say a little bit about uh, Blake and Lave. I think you've done it much better than I was going to do. Um, really, that we, you know, we wanted to do a number of things with this exhibition. Um, one of them was to make sure Blake was massively present uh, in poetry as well as his visual work, which he is. I hope you, you agree with that. Um, we also wanted to bring in these contemporary poets, um, poets who are working under the illumination of Blake in some way. Um, we had one event last week. We've got another one on Wednesday coming. So um, it's a real opportunity really to, to think about how would Blake operate as a poet in today's London? You know, his challenge, the challenges he had then, are they the same as, as for today's uh, poets? Um, and we've got these wonderful new commissions, which you can see on the wall in, in the gallery. It's a selection from what each of the poets has written. Um, and at the events, the poets are reading everything they've written for this commission. Um, so do please come on Wednesday if you can. Um, and this walk we're going to do, um, it's following a route um, roughly of a walk uh, I did uh, for Radio 4 a few years ago, uh, one of the most surreal afternoons of my life, uh, because the idea um, came about from um, Levi Roots, who is the man behind Reggae, Reggae Source, who loves William Blake, uh, oh, and was the first poet, poet he ever connected to when he came to this country as a child. So we went out looking for Blake's angel, um, with, with Levi Roots uh, <laughs> on a really sunny, sunny day. Um, so it also, and it also brings in um, some of the thinking I did uh, for a book I wrote, a prose book called Cenotaph South, um, where I spent about a year trying to find Blake's tree. Um, and I'll talk about that along the way as well. But this really is a collaborative walk today. Um, obviously Garrett's going to be with us. Niall, we're really lucky to have Niall. He's a, a, a walker, um, psychogeographer. Uh, he, he does work wandering lectures around London and has charted lots of Blake territory uh, in central London and beyond. Um, so really Blake and I are putting our heads together and seeing what happens. But because of the, the spirit of Blake and the spirit of Latham, um, we're doing what we would not normally do on a walk. We'd normally just go and then we'd have a chat at the end. But we're, at the end of each point, we're going to stop. Uh, and we'll have a few minutes just, you know, for you to give us your thoughts. Um, you know, if you want to say something at that point, do. Um, you know, that's really important because of who John Latham was and who William Blake was. Now, I need to caveat that with 
we need to keep moving as well um, and we need to be finished about three o'clock um, but you know there will be time afterwards hopefully to talk more as well but we do want your your views along the way so please contribute if you want to uh, and Niall's going to say a few few words before we head off uh, greetings uh, so I'm beginning to get to grips with Latham so he regarded people as rational intuitive organisms so greetings my fellow rational intuitive organisms <laughs> Uh, this kind of corresponds to three out of four of Blake's zoas, right? So just to plunge us into the deep end, Eurozin would be the rational uh, bit of uh, Latham. Eurozin, the, the, the mind, the head. Uh, what's missing out in Latham is Luva, the emotional faculty. So a Blakeian Lathamian might be a rational, emotional, intuitive organism. So Luva corresponds to the, the heart chakra, you could say it that way as well. Uh, Orthona is the intuitive or even imaginative faculty to bring in a bit of Jungian language of four faculties. So that's, the, that's uh, Latham's intuitive. And <coughs> Tharmas corresponds to sen the sensational faculty, the body and, 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 and so on. And uh, that's uh, Latham's organism. So walking is a very good way of uh, getting your zoas into, getting your zoas aligned and kind of opening up closed zoas and maybe, you know, kind of relaxing overactive zoas as well. <laughs> uh, I've been w taking Blake for a walk for over 10 years now, it began, <clears throat> I had a book called Paddy Kitchen, uh, Poets London by Paddy Kitchen. Does anyone know this book? I've seen this book here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paddy yeah. Kitchen's a woman as well. So that, that uh, uh, and um, <clears throat> it sort of marks various uh, poetic sites in London. So I began just going out with Paddy Kitchen and I began noticing Blake sites. So eventually I devised a walk, the William Blake Walk, which is a central London walk. and. Uh, that uh, it was great fun, great fun doing that. Lots of people very interested, and in, uh, people were able to find out about, you know, from say Mayfair to Strand, about the essential Blake sites where he lived, worked, studied, and, and even died. But then I began expanding operations. I developed a second walk going east. You're thinking of the four directions west, east, south, and north. This is part of the four zoas and fourfold philosophy of Blake, the fourfold city. So I devised a walk which began at the Death Place, the Savoy Hotel, and I call it the William Blake Watt Tyler Walk. Mm -hmm. So that's from where he died to where he's buried, and it's going into the East End, uh, Bunhill Fields. But it passes through, because Watt Tyler burnt down the Savoy Hotel with his cohorts, it was good to bring in Watt. And then you pass through Smithfields where Watt was killed by the mayor of London, William Walworth at the time, and then end up at the burial ground which was also the final home of uh, John Milton, Blake's great English poet predecessor. Then I kind of developed a Western walk, which I called Jerusalem's Pillars. It started at Tyburn, a very marble arch, a very important site for William Blake, where the public executions had happened. And it kind of went through Marylebone, kind of looking for Jerusalem's Pillars. Where would Jerusalem's Pillars actually be? Uh, and I connected it to the Jew's Harp Tavern, this famous pub that he probably went to. Uh, passed by as a kid or maybe even had a pint as a young adult, the Jews Harp. So I tried to locate the site of the Jews Harp Tavern and there's two amazing fountains in Regent's Park. So they became the pillars or emblems of the pillars. And that walk continued up to Primrose Hill. But what, what you got was the triple gallows of Tyburn. You get this negative triplicity. You're starting at the most nightmarish possible Blake site. But then Primrose Hill is the sort of bardic hill where Yolo Morgenweg and the Welsh bards uh, sort of recreated the ancient order of Druids and sort of bardic, Vatic, Druidic activities. And there's a sort of uh, emblem there. It's a three, the three rays of light. It's Awen, it's the Welsh for inspiration. So you go from a negative triplicity to positive triplicity on the top of Primrose Hill. The Southern Walk, and it's <coughs> encroaching on Chris's territory. What I'd always noticed was the Rambo territory in Waterloo and Blake territory in Lambeth. There didn't seem quite enough for a whole walk, so I just combined the two. So I developed a sort of uh, uh, Rambo Waterloo Blake Lambeth walk. So it's kind of uh, 1874, and then passing through 1874 Waterloo uh, from Blackfriars Bridge, where Albion Mills was burnt down, and then passing through Blake uh, Rambo territory. But then you suddenly cross, it's like you cross from from uh, Waterloo into Lambeth, and you cross from the 1870s into the 17, 1790 when, when um, 
Blake moved to Lambeth, and then you, you can take in all of that. And then the final walk I did, the Northern Walk, was William Blake and the Visionary Poets of Hampstead. Because he visited uh, John Linnell North End in Hampstead so regularly, there's a plaque for John Linnell and William Blake. It's really hard to find this place. So you pass through, you pass through Hampstead and you meet all these other amazing visionary poets like Tagore and Shelley and people that passed, D.H. Lawrence that passed through Hampstead. And then you finally go through the jungle a bit and through the muds of Hampstead to find North End and that great site where Blake visited his patron uh, regularly, John Linnell's great patron in his old age. And also where actually Linnell said, look, if you want to come and die here, come and move in with Kate, he, Blake turned down the offer. But it could have been actually Blake's final, could have been the site of Blake's demise. So, so um, I did five of these Blake walks just at the end of last year, and then suddenly this invitation came in. So after do, sort of taking large crowds around the, the north, south, east and west and centre of Blake territory, uh, it's marvellous to have been then invited down to Peckham to continue the exploration. This is Chris's manner, really. Uh, so I'm very happy to be Deputy uh, Blake Walker in Peckham. <laughs> uh, thank you very much to Gareth and Chris. Uh, it's You're been welcome. a wonderful project so far. Yeah. Should we do it then? <coughs> Should we go where the rain's off? Let's head. First up is uh, Goose Green. Okay, so if you follow us. I'm just going to read the short section from Blake's first biographer, um, which tells us where Blake saw his vision of an angel. Uh, so Blake was about eight years old, um, and Alexander Gilchrist, his biographer says, sauntering along, the boy looks up and sees a tree filled with angels, bright angelic wings bespangling every bough like stars. He returned home and he relates the incident and only through his mother's intercession escaped the thrashing from his honest father for telling a lie. Okay, so this is a really important um, part of the story that Blake's vision ends in a potential beating. Um, I think this is something he held with him for the rest of his life, um, standing by his vision, standing by his imagination against various institutions of power. Uh, but maybe we should just think a little bit about, you know, what, what is going on with an eight-year-old boy walking the six or seven miles on his own from Soho to here. Now, that's quite a long walk for a boy on his own. Uh, a, a dangerous time, you know, I, I think we're tempted to think um, it wasn't London, what wasn't what it is today back then. It was a better time. In the same year, there was a woman called uh, Elizabeth Brownrigg who was trialled for child abuse in London um, against many children, many of whom were in the Foundling Museum. Um, this was a really dangerous time for children. Um, we know Blake was cared for. He, he had parents. He was very close to his mother in particular. Um, but somehow he had a licence or he made, he made a, a, a way up, a story up to get out into London to walk across Westminster Bridge probably which was a new bridge, only just opened in 1750, over into Lambeth, onto the Surrey side. Um, it would have been a marshland, pretty much very open space, um, through um, the Dog and Duck Tavern, very lively part of London, which is by the Imperial War Museum today, uh, a place where you could buy laxative springs, so um, spring water from the marsh that will cure your ailments I wouldn't fancy it myself, but um, it was available. Um, and then he would have arrived at what we know as Elephant and Castle today. It was called Newington Butts at the time. It may have been related to the Lax Laxative Springs, I don't know. Um, and it was a very busy part of London, as the Elephant is today. It was a crossroads at the time. Um, coaches and horses coming in and out of London would cross at Newington Butts. Um, they had a churchyard there, so it was a place of death. Um, and it was a place that was very much in the later years associated with cholera, so a very, a very poor area as well. Um, but Blake was on a mission. He was coming here for a reason. Once he got to Camberwell in particular, the landscape would have very much opened out. And he would have seen what he could see from central London in those days. He'd have seen the Surrey Hills. 
Uh, and we know from uh, Alexander Gilchrist um, that Blake's um, vision here was a Peckham Rye on Dulwich Hillside. And Dulwich Hill is what we know today as a collection of hills. Um, Champion Hill, Hearn Hill, Red Post Hill. Really it's the same hill seen from many angles and we tend to give uh, individual districts their own name these days. But in Blake's world it was Dulwich Hill. It's a very big area all the same so it doesn't help us to spot the exact location of his angel very much other than that we know it was on the on this side of Peckham Rye rather than the Nunhead side of Peckham Rye. Um, but I also think Blake may have been tempted here by Peckham Fair. Um, we have no evidence for this but there was a fair in Peckham from the medieval times through to 1827 so up until Blake's death. Um, and I'll give you just some, before I hand over to Niall, I'll, I'll give you some descriptions of what a young boy might have saw at Peckham Fair. And this is actually an 18th century account of Peckham Fair. Uh, so he could have seen, and these are all quotes, he could have seen the pelican from Egypt. Uh, he could have seen an eagle of the sun that takes the loftiest flight of any bird that flies. He could have seen a curious beast bred from a lioness like a foreign wild cat. Uh, the he panther from Turkey and the two fierce and surprising hyenas from the river Gambia. So I mean if anything was going to tempt uh, an eight-year-old boy to walk seven miles from uh, you know urban um, congestion to here that, that might have been it. Um, but also on that um, list of, of what was available to see it's worth thinking about Blake's later uh, anti-slavery position uh, which he writes about in Songs of Innocence and, and the epic poems uh, because you would have also been able to see what was described as an Ethiopian Tobo savage having all the actions of the human species upwards of five feet high. So that really shocking description of another human being. Perhaps Blake saw that as a boy and, and that stayed with him. That kind of anti humanist precedent that was set by adults at the time and the boy as we know very much stood up to many authority figures throughout his life. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Niall to, to give us some more thoughts on, on Peckham. Yeah, um, the, the, the uh, quote that Chris began with from uh, Gilchrist, very poetic prose Gilchrist, so I noticed the word saunter which I just want to say for those of you who don't know, it derives from Saint Terre, Holy Ground, and pilgrimages to pilgrimages to the Holy Land. So sauntering is really uh, what you did in the Middle Ages when you were giving up life for a few years and going to going to Jerusalem. So I always think of it's a great word to describe what we're doing now, sauntering. So it's the the Holy Ground. The other word, bespangling. That very nice word, bespangling makes me, it reminds me of um, the, the phrase at the end of chapter 2 of Ulysses, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. So that puts me in mind of, of that. But that's Gilchrist. That's Gilchrist. Uh, it's great to be here. So the, the mural celebrates the vision. So this, this is real local mythology. Blake seeing angels in Peckham Rye and is celebrated in this amazing mural. The pelican is there, isn't it? And they say, right, so they repainted in 2009 with added Blake poem, Echoing Green. So it's nice to think of the, uh, the Echoing Green, which I would like to recite for you. <clears throat> the Echoing Green. The sun does arise and make happy the skies. The merry bells ring to welcome the spring. The skylark and thrush the birds of the bush sing louder around to the bell's cheerful sound. While our sports shall be seen on the echoing green. Old John with white hair does laugh away care, sitting under an oak among the old folk. They laugh at our play. And soon they all say, Such, such were the joys 
when we all girls and boys in our youth time were seen on the echoing green till the little ones weary no more can be merry the sun does descend and our sports have an end round the laps of their mothers many sisters and brothers like birds in their nests are ready for rest and sport no more seen on the darkening green thank you hey. the first thing uh, i notice about that is that when you uh, do that you get a kind of uh, sense of the change in the third stanza uh, with the pronunciation of the word the right so when it's echoing green is the echoing green the echoing green when it's darkening green it's the darkening green so you get two different there's um, questions who is old John who's old John where was the echoing green did Blake have a specific playground in mind was it Golden Square or was it Willans Farm where boys to bathe delight I'd like to look we're trying to locate the tree today but I'd like to locate the echoing green where was it Golden Square may be too small. Um, old John, is that John Milton? Who's, who's Old John? I've got a friend uh, called John Constable, uh, but his shamanic alter ego is John Crow. Some of you may have heard of him. He's active in this borough, Southwark, uh, and he, he hangs out uh, by the old uh, medieval burial ground, and he's had a vision of, uh, vision of uh, medieval Southwark and a female prostitute called the Goose and so he celebrates that in his book The Southwark Mysteries so for me old John I think of John Constable my my venerable friend but while we're here in Goose Green I think of the name Goose Green so I think of the uh, the innocence the innocence uh, of the the mythological vision that overarches this area um, I think of the echoing green and how that sort of uh, innocence is is beshadowed by, by in an amazing way by the the the, 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 the catabasis, the descent in the final verse that everyone has to undergo. Everyone has to undergo that descent. So I think about that. But then I think about the goose. Why is goose green called goose green? In Southwark, the geese were licensed prostitutes. The Bishop of Winchester, whose palace was next to the clink. And so they actually licensed prostitution in the Middle Ages. He collected taxes on it. It was one of Southwark's uh, industries. It was like uh, Amsterdam, the red light district. Uh, and geese were the Winchester geese. These were the working girls. So Goose Green, it may have been, the, the etymology of Goose Green may be connected with that. This could have been, this could have been a place where, you know, outdoor activities were, were, were occurring. Uh, if you couldn't afford the pubs of Southwark, it could come further south. South being a very uh, fanar fanar type of word as well. South work, Southwark, su southern work. It's kind of like sex industry uh, term as well. So from innocence we pass to experience and just thinking of that type of activity. How brilliantly it's portrayed in the final stanza of London. Uh, most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse Blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights of plagues the marriage her the youthful harlot could even be a kidnapped traffic child couldn't it and uh, the harlot then passes syphilis to the husband who passes it to his wife and the child is born a complete nightmare at the end of uh, at the end of London two other things I want to share with you here two sites we couldn't go to today North Peckham sites there is a Blake's Road in uh, in North Peckham uh, check it out when you're there. Uh, in, uh, in Felpham, in Sussex, there's a Blake's Road as well, where the Blake Cottage was. So, Blake's Road. I think what happened is that some local councillor said, right, what we, it's a new kind of new estate, modern. What we call this road then? Oh, uh, that's that painter, Blake, William Blake. What, just call it Blake's Road. So, it, it was named after William because of the local connection. But it became famous in the year 2000 as a tragic connection. Again, the innocence of childhood 
moving into a very, very, very bad experience. It's where Damalola Taylor was attacked uh, on, uh, in the year 2000, 27th of November, the day before William Blake's birthday, the 28th of November, Damalola was attacked by a, by a little gang and uh, whether he fell in a bottle or whether it was a, actually stabbed is still slightly disputed but he died he then he was attacked on Blake's River he crawled to his own t block a bit further north but died in the uh, died in the stairwell terrible death um, there is a Damalola Taylor health center and a Damalola Taylor charity though now it's one of the big things uh, in North Peckham so something very good has come out of it the other local connection is Oliver Goldsmith. The other great literary connection with Peckham is the Irish poet Oliver Goldsmith, um, who, uh, who taught in Peckham in, uh, in just around the time Blake was being born. Oliver Goldsmith was teaching at Dr. Milner's Academy in Peckham. He was working on an inquiry into the state of polite learning in Europe, one of his early, early books. Nice to think of him here as Blake is being born. Blake actually met Goldsmith when he was an apprentice engraver uh, at Bazier's in Covent Garden. He was uh, working with Bazier and in walks uh, Oliver Goldsmith. And this would have been around 1773. Goldsmith's play, She Stoops to Conquer, it hit the, hit the Covent Garden theatres, was an instant masterpiece. And Goldsmith was the man of the hour. He walks into... Uh, he walks into uh, he knew Bazir well, they were friends. Uh, Goldsmith was really interested in all kinds of intellectual activity, so he would have deeply admired Bazir. Blake saw Goldsmith, uh, and uh, now everyone else thought Goldsmith was hideously ugly. They, and people, his, his illustrious friends, all kind of laughed at him. They loved him, but they kind of laughed at him. They kind of thought he was an inspired idiot, terrible conversationalist. They all agree he wrote like an angel. That was the verb. He wrote. <laughs> like an angel, uh, but they also is really ugly. But Blake, always going against the grain, what Blake said to Bazir was, when I grow up, I'd like to have a head like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's enough for now. Sorry about that. Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go to Peckham Rye next. Um, any thoughts? Does anyone want to contribute anything at this point? Uh, just that, uh I was invited to the party at the opening of 27 years ago wow. by Stan. Yeah. And uh, he went to uh, America and was. Stan Peskett's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really good friends and helped John uh, uh, Basquiat out. Yeah. He's very famous for helping Basquiat. Get a photo of him standing there at the back. Really? Yeah. And he's yeah. a yeah. daughter, yeah. daughter, yeah. daughter, yeah. daughter yeah. of Georgia Peskett. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Amazing. Great. So it's become quite part of the Peckham landscape yeah. now, hasn't it? It's hard to imagine it without. Who's in there now, I wonder? I don't know now. Yeah. Um, and last Did time... Knock on the door? Yeah. <laughs> last time I was on this walk, um, I, I was with uh, Christina Vit Vitti from the Blake Society at the time, and she was asking uh, where was William Blake in this picture, and she said it was the woman on the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you look closely, it says William Blake above. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It does look a bit like Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why not? Any other thoughts before we, we head? Do we know um, what season it was, what time of year when he went on this expedition? We don't, we only have the Gilchrist um, account, don't we? It's uh, it could definitely be yeah. the hottest day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so it could have been. Peckham Fair was in the August, so maybe that, that will connect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I never knew about the... Uh, yeah. Really yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's possible, yeah, yeah it's possible. Yeah. What is Gilchrist's source for his uh, so he spoke to, um, he actually spoke to somebody who'd been told by Blake, I think it was an Samuel old woman. Samuel Palmer, I think, as oh, well. It was a Palmer as well. Palmer as well. So that's why it's such an important biography, because it's the one that was in, written in living memory of Blake. So pe people who'd known him, had met Blake, were passing on the accounts that Blake had told them. So. This chap, recent biography by Tobias Churton, uh, questionable in its motives uh, at times, he goes into the origin very much of this, uh, this story. He says that all of Blake's early biographers, Malkin and Cunningham, people who wrote short, Crab Robin, people who wrote short mm. essay length biographies of Blake, none of them mention the vision in Peckham of the Angels. Mm. So Gilchrist is the first to publish it. But he seems to have picked it up from chatting to uh, <clears throat> Palmer uh, and uh, uh, what's the, the youngest guy? 
the young portrait painter who was with him when he died. Oh, um, George. Richmond, that's yeah. right, George Richmond and, uh, and Samuel Palmer, fr friends who knew Blake when they were very young. They seem to have been the source for that story. It's the so Gilchrist is the first biography that it appears mm -hmm. in. Uh, I think there's something in the story that um, if you tell someone you see an angel, they will think you're mad. But if you prove yourself to be a genius later in life, for, the story suddenly has validity. Yeah. And I think that's what's happened over time. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, just, should we move on to Peckham while the weather's still with us, just about? So we, that was a long walk, so thank you everyone. Um, that was like almost the full extent of Peckham Rye, but the sun is, is smiling on us today, which is great. Um, we've come here to this spot for a specific reason. So you can hear just behind me the trickling of water. Uh, this is the River Peck. Okay, it's one of London's underground rivers. It wasn't always an underground river. In fact, Peckham is named after the, the River Peck. Peckham meaning the village on the River Peck. And it would have gave Peckham its, its boundary lines from other boroughs in London. And actually this river starts up in Honour Oak. And you will not see this, this river again once it leaves Peckham Rye. It, it's underground all the way um, to the Old Kent Road where it meets what was historically called the Earl's Sluice um, and in Chaucer the, the, the pilgrims stop on the Earl's Sluice to tell each other a story so um, this has great kind of sacred um, roots here really this river going right back to Chaucer and in fact um, on an oak where this river starts is named on an oak because Queen Elizabeth I uh, was on a visit to Lewisham and she wanted to stop. It was a, a summer's day uh, and rest and um, she, they gave her a spot under this massive oak tree um, and she had a picnic and she revived herself and they called it the Honour Oak. It was the Honourable Oak where Queen Elizabeth had sat. Um, that tree has been replaced by another oak now so it's still a, a spot um, up in Honour Oak there. Um, and that obviously gets us thinking about oak trees um, and Blake's angel. Um, now, just to go back to um, the Gilchrist quote um, that we talked about before, the first account we have of William Blake um, uh, seeing his angel, it simply says the boy looks up and sees a tree filled with angels. Okay, the, the kind of tree is not specified. Um, and when I was trying to, lo uh, like many people before me and many people who will come after, and like many people here today um, who have gone off on their own pilgrimages to find Blake's tree, I wanted to do the same for this book that I was writing. Uh, the book was about Nunhead Cemetery, but because this is a, a place of poetry, South East London, I, I ended up going much further afield. And of course, Blake pulled me into Peckham Rye as part of that, that book. Um, now, there are reasons why it's tempting to think of the tree as an oak. We have the Honour Oak, of course, um, where Queen Elizabeth stopped. Um, the oak is also uh, the Druid's tree, so wherever there, there are Druid sites, there are evidence of oak trees haven't been planted. It is Albion's tree, it is, it is the tree of England that's um, been celebrated as a, a, as a, a, a native tree. Um, traditionally it's known as a chieftain tree, um, so a, a tree of the privileged, 
Um, and in Blake's world, in Blake's mythology, the oak tree is often a good thing, as in the echoing green we saw before. It's a community tree, at the place where John sits to tell stories. But also, it's, it's sometimes a bad tree in Blake. You're rising, um, the rational, overly rational figure um, sits upon the roots of an ancient oak tree at one point, um, overly thinking and overly mapping out um, everyone's lives, mapping out England. Um, I wanted to go back to the place where I believe we would find evidence of Blake's tree if it could be found and that is in Blake's poems themselves. Um, Blake's Bula, the subconscious, the source of the imagination, um, that is all in Blake's poetic work, in my view his visual work and his poetic work. Um, and at the National Poetry Library where I work we have a database of all Blake's poems and I, I put, put in tree and angel, I wanted to find a specific tree with, a, with a, an angel both together um, and we have lots of trees in Blake's poetry, we have lots of angels in Blake's poetry but there's only one poem that um, brings together trees and angels uh, and it's, a, it's a, um, a specific tree and angels and it's a poem that Blake wrote as a letter to Thomas Butts, friend and benefactor, in 1802 and Blake wrote with angels planted in hawthorn bowers and God himself in the passing hours with silver angels across my way and golden demons that none can stay with my father hovering on the wind okay so there you've got the only specific reference to angels and a, and a specific tree the hawthorn tree silver angels um, the hawthorn is known as the white thorn or the mayflower um, it's more likely to be spangle as was described earlier in Gilchrist's account because if you look at a hawthorn tree moving in the wind it, it could look very much like an angel fluttering about with these white wings um, now that led me on to try to find a 350 year old hawthorn tree on Peckham Rye which I could not do um, having said that Peckham Rye is not as big as it used to be the hawthorn is out there I reckon but very possibly it could be in someone's back garden could be in the back of a, of a cafe or something like that I think we're all in this together okay you, you can spot a 350 year old hawthorn it could be Blake's hawthorn and then we can come again and do the walk and we can have a look up and, and, and imagine Blake's, Blake's um, angel in that tree but of course it's better that way it's, maybe it's better not to find the exact tree it's better in the imaginary where it can li live onwards into eternity um, Niall over to you thank you thank you uh, yeah the search makes me think of the last stanza of the human abstract uh, the gods of the earth and sea sought through nature to find this tree but their search was all in vain. There grows one in the human brain. Uh, but uh, I, I was just thinking of the Earl Sluice and the, just the, that little bit of history. The Earl in question was uh, the first Earl of Gloucester. He was the son of Henry I, King Henry I. Uh, but he was a bastard. He was one of <laughs> King Henry I's many bastards and one of many royal bastards throughout history. Uh, Boris and Cameron are both descended from the royal bastards of William IV. Royal bastards are always going, what do I get? What do I get? Um, and uh, they get to be prime minister sometimes, these royal bastards. Um, but yeah, Henry I, his son, uh, was, he had one son who was all set to take over. But there was this ship sailing from France, two ships. Henry sailed in the first ship. The second ship, the prince, William, the very rowdy, boisterous prince, and he, he said, right, let's, Dad's gone on the other ship. Let's crack open the wine. And so everyone, 300 people on the ship, were all pissed, completely drunk, including the captain. And then, then the, the ship sailed off and it just crashed and they all drowned, except for one butcher. This butcher, the ignoblest man on the ship, this was the cream of the aristocracy and, and the heir to the throne. They all died. The butcher lived to tell the tale. 
Um, and so uh, at that point, Henry the First said, "Right, well, I got that bastard. I'll give him some land." So this this became his manor, this whole area, and the Earl of Sluice is named after him. But there's a lovely poem by a great Blakey and Dante Gabriel Rossetti, one of the great figures to promote Blake in the 19th century. He's got the White Ship, a ballad. It's a beautiful poem about the sinking of the white ship that the, the prince was on. It's, it's almost uh, Rossetti's Ancient Mariner, re highly recommended poem. Um, rivers, uh, in just switching to kind of thinking about the, 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 the uh, other underground rivers, the one that Blake is most concerned with is the Tiber and the River Tiber. And Max and I and some friends, we've followed it from its source uh, in, in Hampstead to Shepherd's Well to its outflow near Vauxhall Bridge. It's a very good walk to go on. It takes you right through some establishment places like Buckingham Palace. It flows right under Buckingham Palace. Uh, royal excrement. It takes the royal excrement into the Thames. Um, uh, but the Tyburn was particularly significant for Blake because uh, it was the place associated with public executions. In the big books, and especially in Jerusalem, I tend to see that the big issue for Blake towards the end of his, uh, his philosophical life was that of um, public executions. He called it human sacrifice. So his bardic, vatic, druidic studies um, made him think in terms of the, the, the language of the ancient Britons and ancient cultures where societies would have offered up human sacrifices to propitiate their various gods and goddesses. So Blake saw the ancient Britons through the antiquarian lenses doing something like that. And from the ancient culture, uh, this is debate, you know, Steve, Stephen has things to say about this, but Blake, for me, he admired the bardic culture, that was the poetic culture. This is what we're all here, we're gathered under the idea of the bard today. But he, he kind of rejected, I believe, the druidic culture precisely because it, it, uh, it was um, it's almost synonymous with human sacrifice. And Blake sort of then made parallelograms between uh, you know, Br ancient Britain and ancient Israel. So Jesus might be a bardic figure. Uh, Caiaphas might be the equivalent of a druidic figure, a controlling priest who ends up you know, handing Jesus over to be, uh, to be crucified. That actually, there you go, is a human sacrifice. Public execution of a rebellious figure. Uh, as Harry Fainlight said, the government religion is the execution of the rebel leader, but anyone could be sacrificed. So at Tyburn, most people killed tended to be young males who were hungry and stealing food. So uh, David Cameron said, uh, hug a hoodie, but the, the, the philosophy in Blake's mind was hang a hoodie, hang, hang a hoodie. Just get rid of these, get rid of these, uh, get rid of these young nuisances. Uh, and so, when Blake was living at his second last address uh, in South Moulton Street, he just stood in the dock uh, himself for uh, sedition and assault. He could have been uh, sentenced to death himself in these very uptight times. He, he was supposed to have insulted and assaulted a soldier and cried seditious words, damn the king. In a nightmare scenario, Blake could have been uh, executed himself and he knew it, and so he used to point out to, uh, down towards Marble Arch, the Tyburn area, from his own window, saying, they're preparing a gallows for me at Tyburn. This was literal gallows humor by Blake. The public hangings at Tyburn had stopped by then, and were now in Newgate, but they were still going on. Um, so that might have been why he then began to really focus on this issue, but it, it becomes almost the biggest it's the creed occur of William Blake in the final epic poems is why should the authorities have the right to, to decide upon whether someone else should live? It's, it's, it's the same thing that's being explored by Camus uh, in, in um, L'Etranger as well. It, and it's being explored by Dostoevsky and people like that too. It's, it's a very, very big issue. Um, and for Blake is very against it. And so he sees, he sees any form of modern human sacrifice as sort of modern druidism. So, so Tory cabals and the legal system saying, you know, all these kids have to die, that's modern equivalent of druidic sacrifice. But also even generals, uh, Nelson and, uh, and, and prime ministers like Pierce who send 
sailors and troops off to certain death in their own wars for loot, that's a kind of modern form of druidic human sacrifice as well. The authority is just throwing human lives and sacrificing human lives. So it became a kind of all-encompassing uh, idea for him. Um, even if, and it features in, just to give you two lines from the epic poems, um, South Moulton Street, you cross Oxford Street, Stratford Place is the road, a little known street, Stratford Place. Uh, that's where the Tyburn, it was one section of the Tyburn, crossed that road and ran by uh, Blake's house. And so he, he features it in, in his poetry. In Milton, he writes, Between South Moulton Street and Stratford Place, Calvary's foot. So what's that all about? Well, he's seen the river, it's called the Tyburn, and from there he can look down to the site of Tyburn, where the executions had been at the time of writing, uh, Calvary's foot. So uh, it's like the killing fields, it becomes Calvary, because Calvary was the place of public execution in Christ's time. The other line is, this is from Jerusalem, the wound I see in South Moulton Street and Stratford Place. So the, the, the river itself is a kind of wound. Thank you, Niall. Any thoughts before we head on? It's good. Right, yeah? yeah, please. All on one page? All on one page. Yeah. Got a check. Angel Blake, 89, heard a voice saying, Follow the sun. It was the hottest day of the year in 1756. And his mother had just been teaching him Genesis when the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak groves of Mamre. Blake had been thirsty for some time and had no money. Finding himself at Peckham Rye, he looked right up above him, the sun blazing through the broad-winged leaves, and he saw the three angels of Abraham and realised his calling as a poet prophet. London was Jerusalem, all the biblical towns and villages are London. Blake's angel host called him in Peckham Rye. And like Abraham and the Druids, he'd fight the mental fight to bring Albion back to the spiritual wealth of poetic eternity. Blake, age nine, received his calling here in Peckham Rye. Hey, fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. Wonderful. Anyone else want to add anything? Should we? Yeah. The yep. poem you read from your phone, uh, the poem in the letter, what yep. was the title of that poem? So it's a letter to Thomas Butts. Thomas I think it's simply called that. Uh, letter to Thomas Yeah, but it's in his collected poems and okay. all that kind of thing. But next and final stop is Nunhead Cemetery, okay, where we can think about Blake and his ideas of death and eternity. Um, and it's also a really beautiful location, so let's go by the sun shining. So we're right at the heart of Nunhead Cemetery. A place I've come to know very, very well. I've written a book about Nunhead Cemetery, trying to find the lost and forgotten poets. Um, so I found 12 forgotten poets in this cemetery. Um, and it's hard to believe, standing here, that when this was built, this cemetery, uh, and opened in 1840, um, it was on the fringes of London. And it was one of seven cemeteries Called, now called the Magnificent Seven, uh, that include Highgate and West Norwood and Tower Hamlets and Brompton and Kensal Green. Um, and they were built on the fringes of mm -hmm. London because there was such pressure uh, on burial sites in the centre of London. The population of London had doubled in the first decades of the 19th century. Um, and there was literally nowhere to bury the dead. Um, the inner city churchyards were, were full. Um, they were often um, very unsafe, uh, hardly um, salubrious environments. And there were stories of um, some of the churchyards literally um, burying the dead, you know, beneath the floorboards. They were piling up some 
kind of uh, dodgy Wild West style vicars were taking money for burials and um, just this is just throwing the, the dead underground out of sight out of mind uh, apart from the smell that began to kind of putrefy from that um, so it, what these places show these cemeteries uh, that were on the fringes of London is that um, a very um, public problem was addressed um, through really good innovation so it was people with money who came together to to get permission to build these places but it was to address a public problem so it was a, a meeting of, of two worlds they saw um, it as a business opportunity people weren't going to stop stop dying um, so there'd always be money and burial but they could create places um, that were much more um, inviting for the public so uh, when Nunhead was opened it was one of the few places you could see um, certain trees and certain wildflowers um, so it became really a landscape garden and it was built um, in the design of, of many landscape gardens that were being built in London at the time um, and it was also a place um, one of the only places women could walk on their own uh, of a Sunday these spaces were open and it was seen as proper and safe that women could go for a walk on their own um, so there are also places of poetry of course um, all of these cemeteries and I've found poets in every single one of them um, it's very possible that William Blake walked on this spot before it was a cemetery we know he was drawn to the hills of South London and uh, this was known as Nunhead Hill uh, it would have been one of the hills he, he could see um, from from Lambeth certainly maybe, maybe from, from parts of um, uh, Soho if you go high enough um, and um, I've documented uh, the lives of the poets around it so Robert Browning's mother is buried in this cemetery as well uh, Charlotte Mew really amazing overlooked poet wrote a poem called In Nunhead Cemetery and it's about um, well, it's a kind of persona poem written by a man about his dead fiance but actually Charlotte Mew's uh, brother is buried in this cemetery as well um, so these places have always drawn poets um, the nature is one reason for that but also the height you know if you you could if you walk uh, into Nunhead Cemetery there's a spot I believe over there yeah that's what I was going to say it goes into higher ground over there and it's a well-known spot where you can see St Paul's uh, so a lot of people come still to, to get a view of the city um, so really these are places uh, where you know where poets teach us not to be scared not not to um, <clears throat> be you know kind of uh, not, not to put death away you know we, we have a culture where we um, we have often <clears throat> compartmentalized death uh, we've seen it as, as the other thing the place that we try not to think about um, but Blake's mythology is the opposite to that um, in Blake's world the body is just the shell and death is just one stage um, in the process of eternity um, so you know Blake we know he said to at the end of his life um, to Crab Robinson who, who wrote, wrote really important documents about Blake um, you know Blake said he can't think about death as anything other than going into the next room it's, it's just the next part of the process and when Blake's uh, uh, brother Robert died who, who Blake was really close to Blake said um, he, he saw Robert's soul leaving the body clapping its hands for joy as it entered into eternity uh, and all the way through Blake's life he, he kept Robert close as a collaborator he, kept, he, he used Robert's notebook for his own poetic works his own creations um, and you know this dialogue with the dead is really fundamental to Blake's mythology so he doesn't see these great poets who came before him as um, as something to be scared of either actually he sees them as equals and the, the best example we have that is Milton Niall mentioned uh, Blake's poem from uh, Milton earlier John Milton you know Blake's view probably the greatest uh, you know greatest poet from English history um, well Blake had a vision where John Milton came to visit Blake and said I need your help 
um, I've got some things wrong and I need you to write a poem or to make a picture and Blake's response was um, uh, I, I would but I'm, I'm busy with a, with a few things of my own at the moment um, so he kind of made Milton wait um, but then of course he did take on the challenge and write this um, epic poem um, called Milton where Milton um, enters into the landscape through Blake's left foot and I think you've got this collapsing of the spiritual world and the bodily world it's quite this it's quite a strange thing to get your head around that you know John Milton enter, enters it into into the world through Blake's body but you know in Blake's mythology that makes absolute sense because the, the, the body and the spirit are as one um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Niall to give us some more thoughts on on Blake and death and um, eternity and whatever else yeah, comes, um, comes to mind. Yeah, <clears throat> because of the uh, the theme, the bard, uh, I'm thinking of the the graveyard school of poets. The graveyard school. Hey, who hands up who wants to be a member of the graveyard <laughs> school? Dead um, poet society. <laughs> so we've seen uh, Blake's uh, bard. Uh, images and Fatal Sisters. Another one he did was on display at Tate Britain recently. Uh, it was the uh, Elegy in a Country Churchyard. He also illustrated some of that. It's part of the Graveyard School, the Elegy in a Country Churchyard, all these unsung dead. Um, so Blake uh, focusing a lot on that and then he later illustrated Robert Blair, a kind of forgotten poet now, Robert Blair. Um, Robert Blair's poem, The Grave. So this is another example of the graveyard school. Blake spent quite a few years working, doing endless images of tombs and sort of bodies coming in and out, angels hovering over and so on. It's probably the piece of work he was best known by in, in his own lifetime. Uh, but <clears throat> when he was uh, with Bazir in Covent Garden, another thing he, he was told to do, he was sent off to Westminster Abbey so he was constantly drawing the tombs of the dead kings in Westminster Abbey as well. So he got, he got, sort of got to know English history through tombs, through the tombs of the dead. And one very important thing that happened, thing that he saw, not a vision, but it was something quite visionary. It, it was the, uh, he was hanging around the, uh, the Abbey when the, the Abbey grandees decided, right, um, Let's open the tomb of Edward I, see how he's doing. <laughs> they did this, it was I think 1774. Uh, some knight of the realm, Sir Somebody or other, presided over the thing and a big bunch of uh, very eager antiquarians were invited to attend. And because young Blake had been hanging around and was a regular fixture in the Abbey, he was allowed to watch as well and he even managed to sketch. So they opened the tomb of Edward I, the, the villain of the piece. He's the, he's the bad guy, he's the nasty of this, uh, this project, this exhibition. So Blake sees, and, and he, he's sort of been embalmed and he's been put in a marble Purbeck tomb. So he's actually incredibly well preserved. It's a bit like, uh, a, bit like a pharaoh. He's, he's, um, the body is, it's not bo bones, it's a body. It's chocolatey, leathery body. Uh, there's kind of even like something of the eyeballs still remain. Uh, and this sort of strange dust, which is kind of probably oriental spices sprinkled over the king to make him smell nice in eternity. And the robes are still there. And so Blake got a very good look at, uh, at the actual corporeal body of Edward I just when he was a teenager. And I think that's why Edward I is always coming back to him. In the bard, he's this several, he keeps doing and redoing Edward I. It's great to see it and how well he does it. But visionary heads, Edward I came to him in a vision. Uh, his friends would gather around and say, Blake, we're all bored. Conjure up a vision and draw it so that we can see it. And so Blake would amuse his friends during this visionary heads happening. Literally 200 years ago, it was 1820, that he was seeing the visionary heads. Endless amusement, endless fun for people. But when he, uh, this head appeared and uh, uh, he, he, he began, oh, it's Edward I! <laughs> So he begins drawing Edward I, he's kind of looking up and then kind of doing that. People are always seeing Blake doing this. Like one guy comes in to visit Blake and Blake's kind of 
But you know, Blake, it uh, looks like you're drawing from life, but there's nobody there. And Blake would go, there is somebody there, I assure you. <laughs> uh, his name is Lot. You may have read about him in scripture. So it was a bit like this, Edward I. So the friends are, oh, God, it's Edward I. Can't wait to see what he, because the idea is that Blake sees the real Edward I. And then, so other people can get to see exactly what the dead person looked like. You know, none of this made-up imagery. Blake, with Blake, it's the real deal. Like, uh, Blake uh, had a vision of Satan once in, in, in South Moulton Street. Saw this demon, said, Catherine, bring me my things. And by the time the notebook comes down, Blake, it's no ordinary demon. This is actually Satan. So Satan drew the demon. Uh, and then when, this, when, you, when the friends visit, you say, This is the gothic fiend of all our dreams. The true devil. All else are apocryphal. So, this is, so you see the real thing with Blake. So Edward I appears, Blake's getting him down, uh, but suddenly there's an interruption, another vision, interrupting the first vision. And it's, uh, it's kind of William Wallace, Braveheart. <laughs> These are the two old enemies, almost the personifications of uh, England and Scotland of the time. Because it was Edward I who's, who uh, was the king when William of Wallace was executed. So he got two, two for the price of one there. <laughs> but Blake, he didn't tell his friends, he'd actually seen Edward, the, the real Edward I. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, Blake, uh, Blake's endlessly going on about death. Death on a pale horse from Book of Revelations, one of his great paintings. Uh, the sick rose. In Lambeth, I go into the grounds of William Blake House, behind where his own garden was, where he sat naked. If you go behind uh, and in this amazing garden, and you, you can see where Blake's garden was, where he had a vine, a vine tree, and where he, where he lay naked. But there's rose trees there, and you can imagine it's where he wrote the sick rose. That's one of the best, best of his pieces of writings on the subject of death. It's really on the subject of illness and dying. But then the final line is, does thy life destroy? The invisible, does thy life destroy? So the rose dies. High tragedy and two little quatrains. Uh, I'm just going to read from a, a lesser known um, death piece. Um, it's from uh, Poetical Sketches. It's a prose poem and it's called The Couch of Death. The damps of death fall thick upon me. Horrors stare me in the face. I look behind. There is no returning. Death follows after me. I walk in regions of death where no tree is, without a lantern to direct my steps, without a staff to support me. Thus he laments through the still evening till the curtains of darkness were drawn. Like the sound of a broken pipe, the aged woman raised her voice. Oh, my son, my son, I know but little of the path thou goest. But lo, there is a God who made the world. Stretch out thy hand to him. Yeah, there's a kind of young boy dying and the mother and the sister are there and um, the youth replied like a voice heard from a sepulchre my hand is feeble how should i stretch it out my ways are sinful how should i raise mine eyes my voice hath used deceit how should i call on him who is truth my breath is loathsome the very philosophical kid isn't it um, as the voice of an omen heard in the silent valley when the few inhabitants cling trembling together as the voice of the angel of death, when the thin beams of the moon gave a faint light, such was this young man's voice to his friends. I'll just read the last line. The sorrowful pair lift up their heads, hovering angels are around them. Voices of comfort are heard over the couch of death, and the youth breathes out his soul with joy into eternity. Uh, so I'll just, um, I started mentioning the, the, the four zoas and stuff. That fourfold philosophy, what Kathleen Rain talks about, and what Aldous Huxley sort of uh, was doing too, is that they're thinking in terms of the perennial philosophy. So it's a kind of um, ancient world philosophy. It takes in Western stuff like the Dionysian mysteries, the Orphic mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries, but it, it's also it's got you know Oriental dimension too. The, Bhagavad Gita, all that kind of stuff. It's all part of the great tapestry of the perennial philosophy. Huxley has a book called The Perennial Philosophy. So he, it's like an anthology and a kind of 
essay as well. So it includes great excerpts from the poetic books of the world and then commentary by Huxley, who, as we know, is another of the great Blakeians, like Dante Gabriel Rossetti and Yeats and so on. So um, perennial philosophy is very mysterious, but I suppose that one would partly have to think there's some kind of uh, godhead. Uh, we know Blake's attitude to the godheads is uh, intensely mocking. Nobo daddy became the you know, daddy nobody. So uh, uh, Urizen is a bit like God, but it's a mockery of God in a way, a controlling force. Um, but uh, other times Blake makes friendlier noises about God and Godheads. But I think perennial philosophy, you'd have to think there is something. Blake comes up with a great uh, terminology for that something, the poetic genius. The poetic genius. Whoever is dictating the holy books of, that make up the perennial philosophy, who's dictating these inspired books? That's one way to... But the point about Blake, he never rams it down your neck or he never even tells you what it is. Uh, and see, the other thing is you kind of have to think that, uh, uh, as Dylan Thomas says, the first, after the first death there is no other. A great ambiguous line. Death is not the end, is that Bob Dylan? You kind of have to think there is a next dimension, there is another dimension. But again, Blake never tells you what it is. He wouldn't be so doctrinaire as to do that. But you just kind of, that, it's the removing from one room to another. There definitely is some, some other facet to the existence. And he does say this, which is quite optimistic. Every death is an improvement upon the state of the departed. So even if you're a king living in high style, or you're a poor little chimney sweep who dies young, either way, the death is an improvement. So that's quite an optimistic thought, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it there. Wonderful. Um, that brings us to the end of part from, from you. Um, any, any final thoughts? Recitals, comments? Steve, you must have something. Jesus was the imagination of Moses. So it was religious, but not in a, uh, going to church sort of way. Yeah. Yep. yeah, Jesus is one of the great figures in the, in the, he's one of the great cast of characters in the, in, in the perennial philosophy. And so maybe in the western part of the world we call Christendom, you can allow him to be almost the, the, the embodiment of the whole spirit of it, uh, as Krishna might be the embodiment if you're in another part of the world. Eliot thought, should I get into this Indian religion? Actually, no, as I'm in Christendom, I may as well embrace Christianity uh, after he rejected his, his own wasteland philosophy, this sort of second-hand Arthurian stuff. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming along. Couldn't have done it without you all.